Hello everyone. Welcome to the basic lore of Elden Ring. This series would introduce some basic story settings of Elden Ring and the lore we can get from them. Actually, we can learn most of the story settings from finger reader Enia. Ah, great runes are the stuff of demigods, the children of the goddess, Queen Marika. She who is Vessel of the Elden Ring. From here, we get the first definition of demigod. The children of Marika. But in fact, this setting only applies to the current time period. We can find a broader definition of demigod from the description of Godric's Great Rune. Godric's Great Rune. The first demigods were the Elden Lord Godfrey and his offspring, the Golden Lineage. There are three meanings expressed in this passage. First, Godfrey is not an offspring of Mariga, but he is also a demigod. Second, anyone belonging to the Golden Lineage is a demigod. Third, the emergence of demigods began in the age of Godfrey. There were no demigods before this age. Beside the Golden Lineage and the twin prodigies, there are others who have become demigods for their status as Marika's stepchildren. Rikard's Great Rune Rikard was amongst the children of Renala and Radagon, who became demigod stepchildren after Radagon's union with Queen Marika. Although we all know the truth of, Radagon is Marika. But for the folks in the lands between, who did not know this truth, the three children of the Carrion royalty became demigods by recognizing Marika as their stepmother. In other words, for the folk of the lands between, if you are a member of Marika's family, then you can be a demigod. So at this point, we can provide a definition for demigod. Demigod is a non-hereditary title. It existed only in the age of the Erd Tree, and it is conferred purely on the basis of consanguinity or affinity. Demigods do not always have a great rune. Those possessing a great rune are not all demigods either. Knowing this, we can learn that. The rationale for holding the demigod status comes from the regime of the Golden Order, not the Two Fingers. Therefore, a demigod made by Laindel can also be an Empyrean chosen by the Two Fingers, like Lune Princess Runni. Since we have spoken about the Empyrean, let's see how Runni defines Empyrean. Let us speak of the past a while. I was once an Empyrean, of the demigods, only I. Mikola and Melania could claim that title. Each of us was chosen by our own two fingers as a candidate to succeed Queen Marika, to become the new god of the coming age. According to Runni, Empyrean is someone who is capable of becoming the god, or it can be understood as someone who is not yet the god. The rationale for someone to be an Empyrean comes from the two fingers. Runni says the current Empyreans are all chosen by their own two fingers. The previous Empyreans, Marika and the Glomide Queen, were both selected by two fingers. Although we cannot find Mikuela and Melania's two fingers in the game, but in the story settings, the supporting staff that serves these two Empyreans should exist. It can be said, the game does not greatly explain the setting of Empyrean identity on them. Runni, who betrayed her two fingers, is probably the character used to explain this setting in the plot arrangement. According to Enia, Queen Marika is a god, who is the vessel of the Elden Ring. There is only one Elden Ring, therefore, only one god. Even for Runni, who betrayed everything, she still needs to touch Marika herself, when she is going to become a god and enforce her own order. As long as the Empyreans wished to be a god and enforce their own order, there would be a natural rivalry between those who bear the vision of different orders. Meanwhile, each two fingers is responsible for the order represented by its chosen Empyrean. This is why Runni's two fingers only started hunting her down after Runni abandoned her Empyrean flesh. What Runni did before that, including stealing a fragment of the Rune of Death, forging the Black Knives, performing the ritual of imbuing the Rune of Death's power into the daggers, and plotting the Night of the Black Knives. 
can all be seen as Ronnie's efforts to enforce her own order. Her two fingers certainly could turn a blind eye. For it has no reason to be responsible for the current Golden Order or other Empyrean's order. But abandoning the Empyrean flesh is not. This is tantamount to denying the rationality of two finger selection of the god. A betrayal of the whole rules of the game. In fact, two fingers can be tolerant of the Empyreans who don't want to become a god, or even reject their own orders. As in the case of Melania. Melania voluntarily gave up her rivalry with Miquela and become Blade of Miquela, which did not incur the hostility of her two fingers. Of all the two fingers, the one that targets Runni was just her own. Sir Gideon Afnia works for the Round Table's two fingers. He also says that Runni, who does not possess a great rune, is not within the range of our target and needs no attention. So, it is true that there is no mutual accountability between each two fingers. But, I don't know if it's a matter of her own Nox bloodline. Runni chose hard mode for herself, and played an extremely challenging game. Just taking vengeance on her two fingers cost all of her old servants. Without the tarnished, it's hard to imagine how Runni would have accomplished the burning of Erdtree, the defeat of Malaketh, Godfrey, and her father Radagon, all on her own. Disclaimer. I have no bias with the Nox people or Runni. I just give an objective account of the difficulty. Of the path Runni is going to take. Actually, there is another category of god often misunderstood in discussions. The Outer Gods. To figure out their nature, we need to know why they are called Outer Gods. Are they lived outside of thought and existence, just like the Outer Gods in the Cthulhu's work? Or some sort of being situated outside the lands between, or outside of a certain system? Let's list all of confirmed Outer Gods in the game. Scarlet Rot. The Mother of Truth. The Boss of Twin Bird. The Maddening Three Fingers. Yes, only these four have been clearly identified as Outer Gods. Other beings who are close to them in status are not described as Outer Gods. So we will not blindly expand the scope of this group here. With these four Outer Gods, we can then analyze their nature. According to the words of the Three Fingers, the future it leads into is close to the crucible of life. A chaotic form in which all life is blended together. This outer god wants to take the world back to the time of the ancients. When life was not yet differentiated. If this is considered an outsider, then obviously no one can claim to be a local. The mother of truth is closely related to the omen. Whether or not the omen twin brothers are obsessed with the mother of truth. They all have the ability to manipulate the cursed blood. The traits of Omen are also associated with the vestige of the Crucible. The outer god of Scarlet Rod had long ago left the vestiges of its presence under this land. Excluding the boss of Twin Bird, who has no further information in the game, these outer gods had left their vestiges in the lands between in a time period. Significantly earlier than the later gods which are not included among the outer gods. Obviously, explaining the outer in terms of outside of thought and existence, or outside the land between, is deeply flawed. Does this outer mean outside the two fingers as ordered change system? Apparently not. Melania was born with the scarlet rot. The two fingers chose Melania as an Empyrean. Even knowing she that harbored the rot. So the two fingers has no bias against the outer gods and can accept them. Then, what exactly does the outer mean? Deducing the identity of the boss of Twin Bird can help us better answer that question. The Twin Bird is the mother of the Death Birds. The crest of the sorceries dropped by the Death Bird is a circle of half a centipede. In the same shape as the curse mark of death. There must have been this symbol first, and then the black knife assassins carved it on Godwin's body, eventually forming the curse mark. The mending rune of the Death Prince is combined by the two half-will wounds of the centipede, respectively representing death of the soul and death of the flesh. And it has the following description. Mending rune of the Death Prince. 
The Golden Order was created by confining destined death. Thus, this new order will be one of death restored. The circle of the centipede represents the power of destined death. Of course, this is not to deny that the rune of death itself is sword-shaped. The symbol of this strength is basically different from the likeness of the rune of death itself. The circle of the centipede mark can be parted into two. Death can be categorized into flesh and soul. And the twin bird is twin bird. Then it is clear that the out god served by the twin birds is the destined death. Or at least a character who can represent the destined death. Of course, this character would not be the Glomide Queen. The symbol of the Glomide Queen power is the serpent. Since the Golden Order was only established after the removal of destined death, then the destined death must be a strength out of the Golden Order. At least until the Tarnished unleashes the destined death. The Scarlet Rot is also not included in the system of the Golden Order. The Mother of Truth is related to the Omen, and cannot be included in the Golden Order. As for the Madding Three Fingers, as long as one still wants to live well in the lands between, it is impossible to allow it to enter the system of the current order. If we take the outer to mean outside of the Golden Order which is currently enforced, then all four of the known outer gods would fit this point. In the non-Golden Order contexts, these outer gods can be called God as well. Blue Dancer Charm The dancer in blue represents a fairy, who in legend bestowed a flowing sword upon a blind swordsman. Blade in hand, the swordsman sealed away an ancient god, a god that was wrought itself. This act of describing the individual who is not exactly a god as god, on the basis of their subjective attitudes, is actually quite common in the text of Elden Ring. Pure Blood Knight's Medal For Maud yet slumbers beside the divinity. Be patient. The new dynasty is nigh. Mequella is an Empyrean. It's just Moke himself considered Mequella as the god. This text is clearly narrated from the perspective of the Mowin dynasty. As can be seen, even if only in the description of a single item, the texts within are not always narrated from the perspective of a fixed faction, so that these item descriptions are in many cases not completely objective. So it is necessary to think about the narrative perspectives in the different passages of the item description. In fact, the different pagan beliefs in the lands between have their own gods, who cannot be categorized as demigod, empyrean, or outer god. And their status is obviously no higher than these three categories. Examples include the ancient serpent god of Mountain Jelmir, the fell god of flame, worshipped by the fire giants, and the malevolent deity who is depicted in the image of a death bird. They are all held the title of godhood in different narrative perspectives. And in the context of the Golden Order, the only one who can be called God is Queen Marika. She was once an Empyrean, and promoted to the God status under the Two Fingers as Order Change System. After the Empyreans become the new God, the vessel of the Elden Ring, they will enforce their own order in the world. According to Miyazaki, the order can be seen as the law of the world, represented by the Elden Ring, and can affect the physical world. Like how the Golden Order regulates life and death by the Erd Tree Burial. In general, there is no superiority or inferiority between the different orders. In the time when there was no Erd Tree, death was burned in ghost flame. Death birds were the keepers of that fire. Those who dwell within poison know rot all too well. The death that begets life, that comes to all equally. That is to say, it is the cycle of rebirth put into practice. The order itself carries no natural evil. Because a set of laws that can be accepted by the majority would not have only negative effects. Analogy, the god can be seen as the high priest corresponding to one certain order. The order can be seen as a certain kind of canonized philosophy and could have the power to influence reality by being inscribed on the Elden Ring. This is why it is called the Order. 
Under the two fingers is ordered change system. No god or order rules the lands between forever. When a new group of Empyreans are elected, the current god, Queen Marika the Eternal, still has to face the change of god in order. However, in some contexts, the god referred to in the text is clearly superior to the god elected by the two fingers. For example, the Divine Tower. The original Japanese name of these towers is Shinju 2. Shin 2 literally means giving from a god. The Kanji 2 means tower. The corpses of two fingers now placed at the top of these towers and can restore the power of the Great Loon for the tarnished. We know that the two fingers are the envoys to the Greater Will. At this level, the Greater Will has been called a god. Another similar case is Oracle Envoy. Oracle Envoy Ashes. It is said that when Oracle Envoys appear, playing their pipes, they do so to herald the arrival of a new god or a new age. The appearance of these envoys symbolizes the arrival of a new god. The god promoted from the Empyrean cannot be able to take such decision. If so, it would lack the proper meaning of oracle. Therefore, what these oracle envoys conveys should be the will of the greater will. Knowing that the great will could also be called a god, then it could be the god that Sir Gideon Ofnir describes as unkillable. Even if Marika is called, Queen Marika the Eternal. She would have to die when the Empyrean is ready to become the new god and enforce the new order. Based on the above analysis, interpreting this unkillable god as the greater will would be more consistent with the character setting of Sir Gideon Ofnir himself. Scepter of the All-Knowing. The pearl stands for the world, the heavens, and an eye, representing the many forms of knowledge, never fully attainable. Even knowing that, the All-Knowing's hand grasps for it. All-Knowing Helm. Knowledge begins with the recognition of one's ignorance. The realization that the search for knowledge is unending. But when Gideon glimpsed into the will of Queen Marika, he shuddered in fear. At the end that should not be. The worldview Gideon has embraced is. Knowledge is unending. Though Gideon cannot exhaust the knowledge in his lifetime, he will still keep exploring. But after he came into contact with Marika's will, Gideon realizes that the end that should not have existed, the end of knowledge, really exists. The world is not really endless, but he could not exhaust it. This undoubtedly represents a denial of the all-knowing. I'll stay at the round table for a time. I must learn all that can be taken from this place and sear it into my memory. How could I call myself the all-knowing if I did any less? The pursuit of knowledge is without end, for knowledge is never a thing complete. Thus, I maintain the mantle of all-knowing. This end is the God who cannot be killed, the greater will. The world known to human exists because of the life-creating acts of the greater will. Yet human itself knows almost nothing of the greater will. Even if one could create the finger's layer blade that is able to harm the greater will. This blade is still useless without being able to reach the greater will itself. So the ending of Gideon emphasizes a sense of powerlessness. The position of the greater will is truly beyond the reach of we tarnished. In Reichardt's cut dialogue, this is how he refers to the being he is rebelling against. Oh, shapes of gods, meddlers in fortune. I do not abide by your suffocating honor. Which can best summary the identity of greater will. In conclusion, for the various gods featured in the game, we need to know the context in which they are referred to as God. It needs to be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis. After a brief analysis and summarization in this video, I believe you would have a more intuitive understanding of this area now. In the next video, we'll talk about the Elden Lord and the relationship between the God and Lord. Thank you for your watching.